And today, we're going to do some examples of change of variables. So that we see actually how you might do that in practice. And then we're going to, well, last time we only looked at two dimensional change of variables, that is functions of two variables. Uh, so now we're going to extend this, extend the formula to functions of three variables. And this will be in a completely trivial way. I mean, they're, they're, the formula more or less will be the same. So, uh, let's see. So I think last time. Um, we showed that under suitable hypotheses, that you can write down the following formula, and maybe we'll talk about what these hypotheses were. wrote down a formula that looked like this. Okay, so there's a lot going in here. So what was this? Well, first, uh, if you unravel this, there's this R and this S, and R is some region, and S is some other region, hopefully nicer looking. And then there's this T, and this T supposed to be some transformation that takes this region into that region. And this T is written down like this. It's actually uh, a function. Well, over here you, you look at, say, the U, uh, the U and the V axis. And, uh, over here you have right, an X and a Y axis. So the T takes a function of U and V in the u-coordinate and a function of u of v in the second coordinate that spits out the x and y coordinate. So the x and y are both functions of u and v. That's what this is saying. And then this j of t is the Jacobian of t. And j of t equals We know it's u comma v, so I'll just leave that. It's the determinant of the following matrix, where you take the partial derivative of g with respect to u and then v, and then h with respect to u and then v. So this gives you the general Jacobian, and you can evaluate this at a point. Okay, so this was our abstract thing, and we showed that if you use this this abstract thing, you actually could recover the change of variables formula for polar coordinates. Right? We saw exactly where that, that extra r that you always get when you transfer into polar coordinates comes from. Namely, that was the Jacobian right, of the transformation. That's where that r came from. All right, so I want to show you another example, uh, maybe a little less straightforward. Uh, so the example is, well, I'm going to integrate over some r, just the function y. That doesn't sound so bad. So I've got to tell you what r is. So I'm going, to get a, I'm going to get r by taking two parabolas that are on their sides and intersecting them. This is at 1, and this is at minus 1, and my formula for this top one is x equals a fourth y squared minus 1, and for this one over here, it's a minus a fourth y squared plus 1. And I'm only interested in integrating over that region right there. Okay. 
So if I like, I can write my region as a set of all points x comma y, such that, well, let's see, uh, there's actually a problem in the way I've graphed this. It's not symmetric, and these things actually should be hitting on the axis. So let's quickly try to fix that. <laughs> okay, they're hitting. Okay, and that's the point two, which you can easily check. And then they also should be hitting on the bottom. But that, that's not so important to us. Okay. So, uh, it's important because we need to know where y is running through, and it's pretty easy to see here y goes from 0 to 2. So I'm going to view this as a, a type y region. And then what does x do? Well, x runs from a fourth y squared minus 1 to minus a fourth y squared plus 1. That's how x is going. So I'd like to use a transformation to integrate this. And in this one, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. In this one, I'm just going to tell you the transformation. So the transformation that I'm going to use is going to be u squared minus v squared, comma, 2uv. question, but we're not going to answer it at this moment, but a good question is why? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we just let that percolate in your brain for some time. Why would we ever choose this? Okay, well, if we had a good reason to write this down. Yeah? How do we know what transformation to pick? Yes, I, this is exactly the question, right? Why? Okay, we're going to... We're going to get back to that. Okay. Right now, I just want to work through the mechanics, and then we'll get more to motivation. Okay, so if you're going to, uh, assuming, I mean, of course, uh, as long as this T satisfies these basic requirements that we wrote down last time, then we can use it, even if it doesn't help us. We can certainly use it. Kyle. How do we know X is bounded by negative quantities? I mean, how do we know which one is the upper bound? Oh, well, you could actually use either. Uh, oh, you mean, so here, you mean which one is the upper and which one's lower? Well, so remember the x is going this way. So this is kind of the bottom x, this is the top x. So this is your bottom x, but that's part of this curve. And this is your top x, that's part of this curve. Mm -hmm. So that's where our x has to be bounded by. Okay, so. Uh, once you accept that this is something you want to do, then you need uh, the Jacobian. So you might compute that. So the Jacobian is going to be the determinant of this matrix of partial derivatives. So you do first this one with respect to u, and you get 2u. And then this with respect to v, and you get minus 2v. Then this with respect to u, and you get 2v, and this with respect to v, and you get 2u. So the Jacobian, 4u squared minus, minus 4v squared, so plus 4v squared. And, uh, well, eventually, uh, eventually you have to take the absolute value, but I'm not going to have to do that here, right? Because 
this is these are always non-negative. Uh, okay. Also, um, well, it's reasonably easy to see that this function will be non-zero at some places. This is not the zero function. Now, why is that important? Well, one of the, if you look back last time, one of the hypotheses for this transformation t is that the Jacobian has to be non-zero. And this function is for non-zero u and v will be non-zero. This is not the zero function. Okay. Uh, so, we need to finish this picture which means we need to figure out what the S is. That is, if you define this transformation from S to R, so that the image of S is this R, what the heck is S? What is S? That is, what, I mean, we need to write down some region that maps under this transformation to, exactly to R. So let's try something. Let's look at u equaling 1. So if u equals 1, then the x component gets mapped to 1 minus v squared. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, this gets mapped to 1 minus v squared. But it's also supposed to give you the x-coordinates. And the x-coordinates are supposed to go from, from here to here. So this is, this is giving you some information. Right? The x is supposed to be 1 minus v squared. Yeah? That's just putting 1 in here. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. Okay. Uh, what about the y? Well, the y is going to 2v. Now, I know that my y is supposed to sit between 0 and 2. So this, this is already giving me some information. So let's see, what else? Uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, also, from here, I get y over 2 equals v. Just by dividing by 2. So if x equals 1 minus v squared and v equals y over 2, then x equals 1 minus y over 2 squared, which is 1 minus y squared over 4. And that's actually this upper bound. Right? This is 1 minus y squared over 4. So if we look at u equaling 1 and we let v vary, then we can get x less than or equal and we get x on to this, the boundary here. Right? So this boundary is this part up here. Okay, now what do we have to let the y run from? Well the y, let's see, or the v rather, uh, we want that the y goes from 0 to 2. So what should v run from if we want y to go from 0 to 2? 0 to 1, right? When v is 0, you get 0. When v is 1, you get 2. That's what you want. So. So when u is 1, v should run from 0 to 1. And if you do that, what do you get? Well, you'll get there's my u axis, there's my v axis. So u1, we're going to let v go from 0 to 1, which means you just get a line. Think about an arrow here. So maybe it's going from 0 up to 1. And as it goes from 0 to 1, it must be on this path here. 
because this is where the y goes from 0 to 2, and the x equals 1, -fourth, uh, 1 minus y squared minus 4. One, yeah, 1 minus y squared over 4. Okay, so this little straight line here maps to that outside piece. So if I call this a 1, then it corresponds to that piece. And it goes up this way. Because when, when v is 1, y should be 2. Okay, so I know it, it runs that way. Okay. Well, now I want to get a piece that's going to run over here, correspond. So if you had to take a guess what it was going to be, we'll see. To go this way, um, what do you need? You need the v's to still still run. Uh, so what should we try? Well, let's see. We tried u equals 1. What about if u equals 0? How about that? If u equals 0, then you get u squared as is 0. So is that what I like? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Not u equals 1. Try v equals 1. We'll go along this line. So when v equals 1, then you get u squared minus 1 for x. And for y, you get 2u. v equals 1, you get a 2u. So now y over 2 equals u, and so x equals y over 2 squared minus 1, which is y squared over 4 minus 1. And that's what this is, y squared over 4 minus 1. So if we let the v run, and we fix the, or we, I'm sorry, we, let, we fix the v and we let u run, we get this line up here, and what does it correspond to? Well, again, we want y to go from 0 to 2, so we better let u run from 0 to 1. And if you do that, you end up with this bit right here. And let's see, well, when, y is, or when u is 1, y is 2, so it's running this way. So here to here, it's mapped onto this, this connection, this piecewise function. There. And now all we want to do is what? We want to connect them back up. So, well, we don't actually have to do anything because I didn't do anything, but I think we should. So let's see, if u is 0, what happens? When u is 0 and we let v run, so let's leave our formula up. then x equals minus v squared, and y equals 0. So the y part is 0, so you just on this, on the x-axis. So that means you must be going along here, right? because it's minus v squared, so the x is negative. And v, again, we're, if we let it run from uh, 0 to 1, so v runs from 0 to 1, so v is going up and down here now. And I'm going to show you, you really let it run from 1 to 0. It corresponds to this piece. Okay. And now when you get down here, and you track it along this way, so now the v is 0, and the u runs from 0 to 1. So when the v is 0, uh, 
what happens? So x is u squared, and y is still 0. So you're still down here. And u runs from 0 to 1. So if x is u squared and u is running from 0 to 1, then you're going from 0 to 1. And that's region number 4. So this rectangle maps to the border, to the outside border of our region. And since this t is continuous, the stuff on the inside is going to get mapped to the stuff on the inside. So this is the right S. And the nice thing about this S is that it's a rectangle. So it's easier to integrate over. So this tells us that the double integral over R of Y dA equals the double integral over S of, well now we need to replace Y with what it's equal to. Right, it's a, as a function, right, we have this g of u, v, h of u, v. Well, let's see. Uh, every time we see a y, we have to put down h of u, v, and h of u, v is 2 u, v. D u, d, v. But s is just a rectangle, so it's really easy to write down. Well, it's better than a rectangle to square. 0, 1, 0, 1. And we can go, well, I can pull the 2 out, and I can write a uv, du, dv. And if I like, I can split this up because it's by the product rule. So this is 2, integral 0 to 1, u, du, integral 0 to 1, v, dv. And in fact, these are really the same thing, right? Just I've changed the letter from u to v. So this is actually 2 integral from 0 to 1 u du squared. OK, so that's a, a half u squared evaluated at 1 and 0. The 0 doesn't do anything, so it's just a half. Squared. Half squared is a fourth times 2. Oh, we forgot something, didn't we? <laughs> what did we forget? What's that? The Jacobian. The Jacobian. Okay, okay so we got to erase all that. Okay. The price of doing business. Okay, so what's going to happen? You're going to be on a test, and you're going to make the same mistake. Can you erase it all? Yeah, okay, so you got to figure out a way to always make sure you put the Jacobian in. So what was the Jacobian? The Jacobian was... I have 4 u squared plus 4 v squared. Oh, so now you have to fiddle with this thing a little bit more. Well, let's see here. Uh, this is going to give you an 8 and an 8, so you can pull an 8 out. And then you get 2 uh, u cubed v plus a uh, u v cubed. Sounds great. I didn't even, did not even work it out. So uh, let's see. If we do it with respect to u first, then let's see. We get a fourth u to the fourth v plus a half u squared v cubed. Which is, let's see, when we put in the zero, they all die. So we put in the one, and you get a fourth v plus a half v cubed. And then this is going to be, let's see, uh, an eighth v squared plus an eighth v to the fourth, zero and one. And again, the zero is going to kill it, so you get 8 times a half plus an eighth. Okay. And it's not 
the wisest thing to just add these first and then multiply by 8 is better to multiply by 8. Of course, I'm getting a wrong answer, I think. Uh, so that's 4 plus 1, I get 5. When I computed it at home, I got a 2. So there's probably an arithmetic mistake either in my derivation or in when I did it at home. Uh, but it's not so important. Uh, unless you're building a bridge, in which case you should double check these things. At least once. Okay, so uh, there's there's some parts to this that are pretty involved. Yeah, uh, the actual computation of the integral at the end that's that shouldn't be the hard part. Uh, the com computation of the Jacobian again not the hard part. Where are the hard things? Figuring out the transformation in the first place. And then, this was the real bearer, right? Well, I mean, we didn't even show you how you got this T, right? The real bearer was what S is it that's mapping over? So let's take some, some practice. Let me give you another example that might be a little more transparent as to what you should be doing. All right, are there any questions on this other than, wait, why? quick answer to the why question is that sometimes it's going to be more obvious than others. Consider using u substitution in single integral calculus. Sometimes it was very, very easy to figure out what the substitution should be. Kelly? You were from one fourth b to one half b squared? To one eight. Ah, yes, good, good, that's the error. That's good, because I was getting two in my notes. Good, thank you, Kelly. Perfect. Good, good, good. Excellent. So, uh, so here it's clear, right? U equals sine of, I mean, U equals 2x. How did you know that? Somebody asked you, I mean, they're taking it for the first time. How did you know that u equals 2x is the right substitution? <laughs> what's, what's, what's that? It's what's in parentheses. It's what's in parentheses. So you, you can't even answer that, that question. That, I mean, <laughs> you, you know that the answer is u equals 2x. That's the right substitution. And you can't tell me how you came up with that, but you expect me to tell you how I came up with u squared minus v squared, not a two young company, you know, not. <laughs> so, you know that there's a certain art to this, right? I gave you guys some problems last semester that were really challenging. I mean, they were not like this. They were ones where it would let u equal the square root of, or the fifth, yeah, the fifth root of t minus 14 or something, you know, weird stuff that you would never have guessed would be the right substitution, but then if you looked at u to the third, three-half power, it all worked out. We, we did some weird stuff. So that's kind of the, the flippant answer, which is that, well, we can take some practice. <laughs> it's kind of dual on you, you, you get some experience. Okay, but here, I mean, you really, there's something that jumps out at you. There's nothing tricky about this. It's, it's clear. If there wasn't a two there, you'd know how to do it. You put the two there, you, you don't know how to do it. So substitution says substitute away what you don't know how to do. And as long as you can put the derivative in there somehow, you're okay. So let me give you one that's, that looks hard, but at least you have some idea what you might want to try. So we're going to integrate e to the x plus y over x minus y. And the region, uh, let's see. So my r is going to be given by this. It's going to be a trapezoid. So this is uh, 1 minus 2. This is minus 1. Minus 
Oh, sure. No, I think it's the same She just asked why we call it a trapezoid. They call it trapezium. <laughs> I guess it must look like the trapezius muscles. Oh. Which is coming from Latin, presumably. Latin. Oh, well, maybe that's why they call it trapezium? Yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know why you, in Latin this, they're called trapezius muscles, but, but your trapezius <laughs> looks like a trapezoid. I don't know that. They just told me it's a trapezoid, I just so I said, I know. it's a trapezoid. <laughs> my, my stock answer as to why we call something that was from the Latin, it's from, from the Greek, Greek. Yeah, one of the two. <laughs> I'm going to have to learn Latin. Yeah, that doesn't work when you're discussing Chinese, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get as many things from the Latin. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So, well, as long as we're here, we might as well write down what R is. Is it E to the X plus Y divided by X Yeah, this is a divided by. Okay. It's all in the exponent, though. Okay, uh, so, 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 you know. Actually, maybe I didn't even write down the. I didn't even write down the R. It's kind of nasty to write that down, actually, right? Cause... Well, let's see. If you wanted to write this down, um, well, you see, you have these lines here, and you can you could use those, but you're gonna have to break this up if you want to write it down. Let's not, not even write it down. It just looks like a pain. Any way I can think of, you're gonna have to write it as a, a, a union of regions. Okay, so if you wanted to do a change of variables, just think about this as a substitution problem. What would be a good substitution here? Well, remember, in single variable, you'd say u equals sine 2x. But in two variable, you actually get two variables to substitute. You get a u and you get a v. So what would be a good thing for u to be? It's supposed to be u to v. What's that? The whole thing on top. The whole thing on top. So you'd want to make u equal to x plus y divided by x minus y. Well, what's v going to be? Oh, that's not fair. You didn't leave anything for v. No. What if you just let u be the top bit? And v be the bottom. Then they can share. This is important when you have kids. <laughs> of course, with my kid, they would be happy because they're not the same. You know, if one gets a blue cup, the other one's a blue cup. You might try something like that, because then it would look like e to the u over v. At first you think, well, that doesn't sound actually all that much better. It's, you don't know how to do e to the something over something. But uh, remember, they're different variables, right? u and v are completely different variables. And so when you take uh, antiderivatives, you know, you're only going to see one variable at a time. Here, the, the two variables are mixed in the top and the bottom, so it's not as, quite as nice. Okay, so your t is x plus, well, it's, we actually, we, we want to be able to write down a function of u and v here. So we need to figure out what x is. So x is, well, it's y minus, it's u minus y, and uh, if you know, let's see, v is, uh, or x also could be written as v plus y. Um, uh, how can we isolate x in some good way that uses both equations at once? Well, what if you added these together? What would you get? u plus v equals 2x. No, just 2x. Okay, that's not bad. So x is a half u plus a half v. Okay, what about y? How can we get y? Well, idea. I need an idea. Subtract them. Subtract them. Subtract them, right? So u minus v equals 2, two y. Okay, good. So y 
equals a half u minus a half v. So our t would then be a half u plus a half v, comma, a half u minus a half. We might, as long as we're here, we might as well compute the Jacobian. So let's see. With respect to u, you get a half. With respect to v, you get a half. With respect to u, you get a half. With respect to v, you get minus a half. So this is minus a fourth minus a fourth. So minus a half. And of course, we know in the end we're not going to be interested in the actual Jacobian, but the absolute value of it. will be a half. Well, that is not so bad. I mean, a half, I mean, the price of doing business, you know, for polar was an R. Last time it was a 4u squared plus 4v squared. This time it's just a half. That's, that's not so bad. This is just a constant. Okay. But now we need to figure out what the S is going to be. Right? What region is going to map into this R? So, in this one, I mean, it's a little more transparent what you'd want your u and v to be. Okay. Now, is it going to be any easier to come up, cook up what the s is going to be? So, it's going to turn out here that the s is still going to be a trapezoid. It's not going to turn into a rectangle, which is bad, because rectangles are easier. But the function will have gotten easier. I mean, e to the u over v times a half, which that's, that's not so bad, right? If you're integrating first with respect to u and then v, or vice versa. So this is not so bad. Uh, so let's try to figure out. What our, what our region is going to look like. So we know, for instance, that, uh, oh, let's start over here. When you're on this segment, you want to go up or down? Okay. So you're always trying to figure out where the borders are going, right? Because when you have these continuous functions, if you know that you have a region where the borders go to the right borders, then the insides have to go to the right insides. Okay, so here, the y value is 0. So let's see, when y is 0, all right, and x is going between, I'm sorry, what did I say? The x is 0. And the y is going between minus 2 and minus 1. So if x is 0, then a half u plus a half v is zero. Which of course means u plus v is zero. And that means that u is minus v. Okay, and what does y do? Y runs, so y runs from minus, I'll say two to minus one. And so what's happening to our uh, u and v? Well, let's see, we have to be on this line, u equals minus v. And we know that y equals a half u minus a half v, but u equals minus v. So this becomes a, a plus a half v, a half u. So it just becomes u. Yeah. A half u minus a half minus u. So the y is a u, which means if y runs from minus 2 to minus 1, then u runs from minus 2 to minus 1. There's our u axis, here's our v axis. So let's see. 
Uh, u runs from minus 2 to minus 1. So there's minus 2. There's minus 2. There's minus 1. And, well, it's just the line, uh, if you like, you could write this v equals minus u. It's just the line v equals minus u. It's like y equals minus x. So it's going down like this. Fine. Uh, and what, what are the values? So, uh, well, 1, 2, there's the 2, there's the 1. It's got to look like that. Okay, so that line over there going up corresponds to this line going down. Okay. Um, what about here? You go from minus 1 up to 1. So this is on the line. What's this line here? Well, let's see, it's y equals x, but it's shifted down to minus 1, so it's y equals x minus 1. Okay, fine. So if y equals x minus 1, So here, uh, if you like, x is going between 0 and 1. Uh, what can we say? So well, we know y is a half u minus a half v. And this should equal x minus 1. So a half u plus a half v minus 1. So let's see. The half u's cancel. And let's see, let me move this half v to the other side so that I get a full v. And this minus 1 to the other side. So I get v equals 1. So that means that whenever y is on, or whenever you're on this line, y equals x minus 1, the v is actually constant. It's just 1 the whole time. So then what's happening here? So let's see, we said x is say running from 0 to 1. So x is in 0 to 1. And we also know that x equals a half u plus a half v. Uh, or, well actually, we, we I should say is this. We know what the v is. v is x minus y. Uh, or the, or, sorry, we want the u. u is x plus y. Oh, maybe this is even a faster way to see it. Uh, oh, yeah, th this would be faster. Instead of breaking it down based on these two equations, use uh, these equations, actually. Then you don't have the halves floating around. So let me, let me show you what I mean. Let's do it as a, a different way. So y equals x minus 1. But you know that v is x minus y, which is now x minus x minus 1, which is 1. So v is 1. Now what about u? u is x plus y, which is x plus x minus 1, which is 2x minus 1. So since x is running from 0 to 1, well, then u runs from, well, when x is 0, you get minus 1. And when x is 1, you get 1. You go minus 1 to 1. So the u goes from minus 1 to 1, and v is supposed to be at 1 the whole time. Okay. Okay, so that's 2. where y is 0, and x runs from 1 to 2. <clears throat> OK, so let's 
So y is 0, and x runs from 1 to 2. OK, so if y is 0, then u equals x plus y equals x. And v equals x minus y equals x. So u equals v equals x. And since x ran from 1 to 2 and x equals u, u runs from 1 to 2. So we go from 1 to 2, and then, well, v equals u, so it's just the line, it's like y equals x. And now we go back down this line, and what is this line? Well, let's see, this is y equals x minus 2. It's still y equals x, but you've just shifted it down by 2. So now we just play the same game over here. So if we're on y equals x minus 2, uh, let's see. So uh, where is our x running? x is now running from 0 to 2. Okay. So u is equal to x plus y, but y is x minus 2. So this is 2x minus 2. And v is x minus y, which is x minus x minus 2, which is 2. And since x is running from 0 to 2, u is running from minus 2 to 2. And so it's connecting this up. And so the innards have to go to the innards. And so this is our x. Good, good. Now how can we write s? Because eventually we're going to set up an iterated integral. So let's see here. Well, the v. This is. I mean, one nice thing about this. This actually. This was not a type x or y region. You would have to break it up. This one is going to be a type v region. Right? And one way you might think about it is that somehow it's flat now. It's the right way. Uh, um, or the, the the sides are parallel. That you, that you need them to be. They're in the, the, the sides that are parallel. Here, the sides that were parallel were not going in the x. We're not parallel to the x or y axis. They were going diagonal. Here, the sides that are parallel are going with respect to the u axis. That, that's useful, basically. So let's see. Here, the the v's go between one and two, and. Well, the u's are going to go between this line and this line. And we figured out what this line is. This one was minus v, and this one is plus v. So see, this is the line. This was the line v equals minus u, or u equals minus v. This was the line v equals u. If we have that, we now know that the integral over r, e to the x plus y divided by x minus y dA, is equal to the integral over s of e to the u over v times the Jacobian, which is a half, du dV. So this is going to be the integral from 1 to 2, integral from minus v to v. Uh, I'll pull the half out front. e to the u over v du 
dB. And this, you guys can actually integrate. How do you integrate e to the u over v with respect to u? Remembering that with respect to u, v is just a constant. Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a substitution problem. You'd let uh, t equal u over v. You're going to have to pull a, well, let's see, the derivative one would be 1 over v. You not, don't have a 1 over v, so you pull one in, but then you got to put a v out front of it. Mm -hmm. So you pull a can't pull the v all the way out because it's not a constant with respect to v. Uh, but once you do that, then it becomes e to the t, and the derivative or any derivative of that is e to the t, which is e to the u over v again. So e to the u over v evaluated at minus v and v. Okay, um, so when we put in a v, you get v times e to the 1 minus, when you put in a minus v, you get e to the minus 1. Yeah, this is very nice because look what's going to happen. You can factor a v out, and then you get v times e minus e to the minus 1, but that's just a constant. This is a half e minus e to the minus 1 integral from 1 to 2 of v dv. All the hard part went away. Let's see. This is a half v squared at 2. That's 4 over 2 is 2 minus a half. So 4 minus a half is 3 halves. Or 2, no, 2 minus a half, rather, is 3 halves times 3 halves. So you get 3 times e minus e to the minus 1 over 4. Whew. So is it easy? <coughs> Any votes? Vote for hard? Yeah? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Is it easier than computing this integral, though? Okay. So, math does not guarantee that you will ever get an easy answer. It doesn't even guarantee that it will find a hard answer. It doesn't guarantee an answer at all. Uh, but there are a lot of times where math at least can say, well, okay, it's possible. It's not possible that way before us, but with the substitution, it's possible. It's still hard. You still have to do some work, but you can get an answer out if you're willing to put in some time. And like in single variable substitution problems, there are times where it's easier to see what it's going to be than others. And this is something that with practice does get easier to see how these pieces are moving. For instance, after you had seen the first couple of these and noticed that this picture was had some obvious symmetries to it, you probably would have, after a while, you would have just guessed that this is what was happening for the rest of it. You know? uh, just like with the sign of 2x, you would just say, well, I know I'm going to have to pull a one half out. It's just some experience you get that. Okay. Uh, before we are out of time, we're almost out. Let me just write down the three variable formula uh, and let you convince yourself uh, that this is what gives you the right uh, factor for spherical coordinates. So, uh, what do I use? E, F, or do I stay with RNS? I guess I stay with RNS. So, let's say you're doing a triple integral. Okay. 
there is a change of variables formula, and it works exactly the same way. Only now, your function should be given by something like this. So, there's all these symbols up here that you shouldn't try to memorize. It's just the same thing as the two variable, only you've added this w to this, right? So this t should look like g of u v w comma h of u v w comma k of u v w. Okay, t should map again r to s, and all those hypotheses that we have in the two variable case should carry over. Uh, And note, the Jacobian now is the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay, so let's look at spherical coordinates where our transformation laws where x equals rho, sine of phi, cosine of theta, and y equals uh, rho, sine of phi, sine of theta, and z, oops, is rho, cosine of phi. And we assume that, as usual, rho is greater than or equal to 0, and phi sits between 0 and pi. Right? These were our spherical coordinate laws, our transformation. Okay? So, uh, for the purposes of this, all I, if I want to do this transformation, forget about the r and the s business, let's just compute the Jacobian because I want you to see where that rho squared sine phi comes from. So the Jacobian we need to do well see if our, our coordinates are given in terms of uh, if we write it as rho theta phi so then the first one we take the derivative of x with respect to rho Okay, now I'm going to use this convention that I have where I'm not going to write all of sine and cosine. I'm just going to write s, and then if there's an angle, I'll write like s sub phi, because it's a little bit shorter. So the derivative of this, well, the rho is just going to go away. So you get s phi, that's sine of phi, cosine of theta. Then you need to do it with respect to theta. When you do it with respect to theta, this becomes a minus sine. So you get minus rho sine of phi sine of theta. And then, then you have to do it with respect to phi, so this will become a cosine of phi. So you get cosine, a uh, rho cosine of phi cosine of theta. Okay, so that's the, the top. Now we do the y's, so we differentiate with respect to rho, and we get sine of phi sine of theta. Then with respect to theta, so we get rho sine of phi cosine of theta. Then with respect to rho, and we get rho cosine of phi sine of theta. And then with, now we do the z. So first with respect to rho, and we get a cosine of phi. Then with respect to theta, but there are no thetas, you get zero. Then with respect to phi, and you get minus rho sine of phi. So this is a little bit shorter notation, as you can see. So now you need to compute the determinant. Of course, there's lots of ways. Remember, we have we could do our, our crisscross method, or we could choose a row. For instance, this one, uh, which has a nice zero in it. So we might try that. So first, you have to do. Uh, let's see. If you go on this row, you take this cosine of phi times the determinant of this little two by two. So that's minus rho squared sine of phi cosine of phi sine of theta squared. Oh my gosh. Okay. Minus, okay, rho squared sine of phi 
cosine of b cosine of theta squared. Yeah. This is actually really good because look, there's a sine theta squared and a cosine of theta squared, and then the thing in front of it is the same. So you can factor that thing in front out and you get sine squared plus cosine squared, which is one. So that whole thing is, is good. And then you have to do this one. So minus rho sine phi times the determinant of this two by two matrix. So that's rho sine phi squared cosine theta squared minus minus is plus rho sine phi squared sine theta squared. So now look at here. This one you have a rho sine phi squared and then a cosine theta and a sine theta. You can factor out the rho sine phi squared and you just get cosine squared plus sine squared, which is one. So in both of these, you have nice things. So you get a cosine of phi times a minus rho squared sine phi cosine phi. So let's see, minus rho squared, that's two cosines, and then a sine phi. And then this sign, these just all died. And then uh, uh, down here, you have minus rho sine phi. And then, okay, this again you could pull out until you get a rho squared. And then a sine phi cubed. And, well, note here, you could actually factor out a, rho, a minus rho squared sine of phi. This whole thing is minus rho squared sine of phi, and then you have a cosine squared plus sine squared, which is one. So it's just gone, so it's just minus rho squared sine of phi. And when you take the absolute value, that minus is gonna go away. And you get rho squared sine phi, using of course that you're uh, phi is between 0 and pi, so the sine is always positive. So the norm, the absolute value, the Jacobian, is rho squared sine phi. But that's exactly the factor that we pick up from spherical coordinates. Mm -hmm. so that's where it comes from. Okay, so we'll stop there. Okay, so there's a couple problems on the homework for you to do to test this. Um, it's hard, I know that. I don't like to put these kind of questions on tests so much. Uh, so tomorrow we will start, finally, vector functions and vector fields.